Welcome back to our video tutorial series on how to properly configure and install Windows Server 2008. In our previous video, we showed you how to install Windows Server 2008 R2 Edition. We will go through the steps of how to, number one, continually configure the domain controller to allow client computers to connect into the Windows Server. We will also show you how to connect a client computer to the domain in order to share files, to access server resources, and to use the server. And we will also show you uh, how the server can be utilized once it is a domain controller. Okay, so we have successfully turn this computer into a domain controller. And what we need to check is that the server itself is actually linked in with the domain controller. And of course we see the computer name is server, the full computer name is server.test.local, the domain is test.local. When we go to advanced system settings, we check the computer name and we see that it is on the domain so it is hosting the primary domain area here. What we want to do is go to all programs, administrative uh, functions here and we can actually go over to Active Directory Domain Users and Computers and we can see our domain that we have created, the forest, the computers that are in it, clearly we have none, the domain controllers that are in it and that is server server is here, it is part of the domain controller. So what we want to do is actually change our network settings again, go to open network sharing, uh, go to change advanced, actually change adapter settings, and we want to change the adapter setting for this server. We want to make the preferred DNS server, and as you see, it's already done there, 127.0.0.1. That is, in fact, the local loopback address for this server, thereby making this the default domain server. What we also want to do is plug in an emergency domain server in case this stops working, and we will hit OK on that. We can also add a third one, just in case, which sometimes is recommended. And these are all uh, internet-based DNS servers. And what we also actually want to do is make 190, I'm sorry, we want to try to make, just in case here, 192.168.1.15, which is the server's local area network IP address. We want to make that at least the second one uh, that's available out there. Actually, we'll make it the third, so it'll, there'll be uh, sort of a redundancy here. It'll check this first, they'll check that second, it'll check this again, then it'll check that. And we go ahead and validate those settings. Now, we're set up as a domain controller. So what does that mean? It means that client computers can connect in, and I'm going to show you how to do that now by switching over to another client computer. All right, well, we've now come back live, and in this case, it becomes necessary because we're going to machine to machine, and we are in a virtualized environment. Here we have our old favorite, Windows 7. Now, what we need to do in order to connect to the server, and this is something that can be controlled globally through the router, but because we, we're not going to record how to edit a router's settings at this time, we will go ahead and we need, before we can connect to the server, uh, make the computer part of the domain, we must go to Network and Sharing Center and change the adapter setting. So we'll go here to the adapter, the network adapter, the network interface card. We go to Properties. And I love working live on this stuff because now you can see both systems at the same time and exactly what happens. You go to use the following DNS servers. Remember, you're using the public DNS servers that are configured by your router. Now, because you're in a local area network, you want to connect primary DNS 192.168.1.15. That is our server, which is server.test.local. And we go and change an alternate uh, DNS server to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Those are Google's public DNS servers. We hit OK. We go to OK again. And we close. Now, let's just make sure that our internet connection is still working. Something that would be a little bit important before we connect to the server, eh? Uh -huh. Yes, we've connected through the server, acquiring DNS in order to get to msn.com. So the DNS server 
is working. Once you're on the domain controller, you're on a completely managed Windows network. When you're not on the domain controller, you are in a work group. To get out of the work group and to enter the domain, you need to go to Control Panel, System and Security, System, Advanced System Settings, Computer Name, and see, we're in the work group, and so is our other computer, which is actually hosting this video. And you want to change this computer's domain name. Uh, we join it to the member of the domain, and remember, the domain is called test. So we type in T-E-S-T, -T. no doubt we'll be able to find it now that we've changed the DNS settings. And in order to connect any computer to a domain, and this is the bane of any uh, computer technician or uh, administrator out there that needs to do this for like a thousand computers, uh, sometimes we deploy Windows systems uh, that have scripts that can connect all computers to a domain. But how to do this manually is to actually type in test forward slash administrator, or I'm sorry, backslash administrator, and enter the administrator password that was configured for the server administrator account. Hit OK. Once you connect a computer into a domain network, this is just the computer side. You still have a local account on this computer. And usually, if that account has existed for a long time, it needs to be migrated over to the, um, the uh, domain account, which we can create. And a domain account has complete access to the server and all of its resources. But this is the computer side. The computer is now it has the capability to be controlled by the server. So here we are in the test domain. We have to restart the computer, and we'll go ahead and but do that where now. where is our server? Well, the fact is, we're not completely set up yet. But let's try to connect into the server by going to server. And it's going to ask you for a password. And the reason why is you don't have a domain account. So you have to use the server administrator account again until you have a domain account. And there you go. You see that we have some shared folders already that are on the server. And the path here is, of course, backslash, backslash, server. So let's switch back over because this kind of sucks. We're only halfway connected to the server. Our computer is connected into the server, but not our account. So we'll log off here. And while Windows is logging off, we will switch back over to the server. We've got one half of the client configured, but we also need to configure a user account. And this is done under Active Directory Users and Computers. Now, we've already created a user account named Mike, but for the sake of argument, we'll delete Mike and do it again. It's important to understand the difference between a local computer user and a server computer user. A server computer user, which is on Active Directory, or an Active Directory user, is subject to server rules. Uh, all of their content can be hosted on the server using group policy settings, and their desktop can be, be manipulated by the server, as well as their access to server resources. Without an Active Directory user on the server, that user cannot do anything really on the server without a login and password being entered all the time. So here we can see that it's been set up. There's a profile. Uh, there, it's member of domain users, and the domain user group can be controlled using group policy settings under the server uh, to add uh, shortcuts to the desktop, to control what programs can be used, so on and so forth. Let's get back to the desktop now. The desktop is being prepared for the first time. Here we are. Now, you may think, well, what the hell just happened? What's the difference here, right? We're actually connected with a user account to the server, and we're connected on the computer side to the server. This allows us direct access to the server. If we go to search, type backslash backslash server, we have full access into the server, and it shares. Um, if we go to control panel, if we go to network and internet, 
And if we go to view network computers and devices, we now see the server, okay? And we see the work group as well, but we also see the server. And this is where the change has occurred. This is where we can now set account policies through the server. We can set um, password timeouts. We can put stuff on the desktop for 100 computers at the same time. Uh, we can do all sorts of things and see. Here we are, we see what's on the network, our main Windows 7 client computer and the server. And let's also find out what we can do with the server if we still have some time. Well, we've returned to the server, and what we want to remember is that we shared out uh, something here, reports, and we shared out reports to all domain users. They can read and write to this folder and they can find it by going to backslash backslash server reports. But let's assume that they have no idea that that exists. They have know nothing about it. This is where we want to get into group policy management. And group policy is spread between two different concepts. And in the domain, you have group policies that are geared to the computers and group policies that are geared towards uh, Active Directory users. So there's those that computer and user component. In this case, we're going to create, as we see, we have a default domain policy which affects all computers on the domain. And we have a default domain controller policy which affects all domain controllers on the domain, which is our one server. Uh, in this scenario, we want to create a new group policy. Uh, the default domain policy controls Windows security settings uh, and you know account timeouts and so forth and so on. It's highly recommended that you do not edit the default domain policy unless it's for security reasons. We'll go to group policy objects, okay, GPOs, and we'll go to new. We'll call it shared folder policy. Now our goal for this group policy is, in fact, to um, cr uh, map a drive to drive Z uh, with reports. And it's also to uh, not only map the drive, but create a link on the desktop. And what we want to do is go down to user configuration. And here we have drive maps. And we want to do a new mapped drive. And the location for this new mapped drive is <coughs> backslash backslash server reports and we do an automatically reconnection and we'll label it as reports. Actually we're really able it as business reports. And we'll use drive letter Z. And that should create the path for that. Now we also want to go to shortcuts. We'll create a new right click and create a new shortcut and we can see the setting there all right so what we want to do is enable uh, this we see that it's enabled uh, what we want to do is link it and we want to link it to the domain so we link an existing GPO shared folder policy and that shared folder policy is now linked. Well, it's set for authenticated users, but for security filtering, let's also make it for domain users. And we go to CMD, the command prompt, GP update forward slash force is business reports. It's already appeared on the server and it will appear on our Windows 7 machine. Well, there you have it, everyone. We've successfully showed you how to install Windows Server 2008 R2, how to configure it to become a primary domain controller, and also how to use group policy to create a network share and map drive on the network. What you should know is that group policy is an ever-evolving standard, and you should check every once in a while to make sure that what you're doing is correct. Overall, we've given you a good overview of how to use group policy, how to create a domain controller, and how to install Windows 2008. Be careful with what you do with Windows Server. Use a test environment before you implement permanent changes and visit windows7forms.com.
Thanks for watching.